Hi, everybody. Good evening. Good afternoon. Uh, it's uh, 7 p.m. in Paris, 7 p.m. in Barcelona, 1 p.m. in Boston. Uh, I'm Mohamed Mouti from the Sorbonne University in Saint Antoine Hospital in Paris. And it is my great pleasure, like every uh, two weeks, to welcome you all to the ICH uh, Journal Club. Uh, the, uh, we have this journal club uh, uh, twice per month. Uh, and it is my great pleasure to be uh, joined today for, uh, by Dr. Red Merriman, who is a physician and instructor in the uh, lymphoma division uh, at the uh, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, I'm also pleased uh, uh, and would like to welcome uh, Dr. Anna Sureda, who is the head of the Division of Hematology at the Catalan Institute of Oncology uh, in Barcelona uh, in Spain. So thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the Journal Club, uh, this is supported through a generous unrestricted educational grant from Takeda Oncology. And for the uh, broadcast of uh, tonight, for this Journal Club, the Scientific Steering Committee of the IACH selected this article, which has just uh, uh, been published in the journal Leukemia, and the title is Allogenic Transplantation After PD-1 Blockade for Classic Hodgkin Lymphoma. And as you may guess, we have always uh, usually the first or last senior author of the article uh, as a panelist, but we have also uh, an expert who did not participate to the study who will also participate. So this is the reason why we are very pleased and honored having Do Dr. Ray uh, Merriman uh, with us and uh, Dr. Sereda will be the other panelist. You can see uh, the abstract of uh, this study and I think uh, many of you are quite familiar that uh, anti-PD-1 monoclonal antibodies uh, are being increasingly used in uh, refractory relapsed Hodgkin uh, lymphoma. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, these uh, uh, wonderful new agents are not curative in many patients. And this is why uh, a significant proportion of these patients are undergoing allogenic stem cell transplantation. And obviously, it's very difficult to run prospective trials in a, such an orphan, I would say, and rare uh, disease and uh, rare setting because obviously uh, the majority of Hodgkin lymphoma patients are cured without uh, transplantation and without uh, anti-PD-1 uh, monoclonal uh, antibodies. So this is the reason why uh, Dr. Red, uh, Dr. Merriman and uh, colleagues performed really a very nice uh, retrospective analysis collecting data from uh, several centers with a very nice uh, and decent uh, median follow-up of uh, two years to look into the uh, outcome of these patients who received uh, uh, PD-1 anti-PD-1 monoclonal antibodies and then proceeded to allotransplant. And uh, their conclusions uh, are quite uh, uh, positive because you can see the results here. And these results, and we will discuss this, uh, looks uh, much better than what was previously reported in case report or smaller studies. But also an important finding uh, from this study, apparently, uh, also it's not a randomized, it's not a controlled trial, was about the positive impact of using post-SI, uh, post-infusion of the graft and cyclophosphamide for GVHD prophylaxis, which is something extremely attractive. You can see here the, in the multivariable analysis for PFS, OS, but also GRFS, the uh, impact of uh, the different parameters. And we will have uh, 
the opportunity uh, to uh, discuss all of these issues with our uh, panelists. So without any further delay, I would like to launch this uh, discussion and actually uh, ask first uh, uh, Dr. Sureda, ladies first. Uh, uh, before digging deeper into the results of uh, this uh, article, what, is, what are, in your opinion today, the indications uh, for allotransplant in uh, patient with Hodgkin lymphoma? Uh, Anna, please. So um, thank you, Mohamed, first of all, for inviting me uh, to this seminar, uh, which I think is going to be really interesting. Um, hopefully, we are going to learn quite a lot of things. And thank you for asking me this not so easy to answer question. So I have always been um, very much a defensor of allotransplant in Hodgkin lymphoma. I remember many years ago when every single patient that relapsed after an autologous stem cell transplantation was a candidate or a potential candidate for an allotransplant. Then we had brentuximab bedotin that complicated a little bit our lives. And then after the beam, we have the possibility to, to use checkpoint inhibitors. And uh, the other problem that we may discuss later on is that unfortunately, as you have said, we don't have prospective randomized clinical trials that indicates us which is the, uh, the way to go. And the reality is that if we look at the numbers coming from EVMT and from CIVMTR, the numbers of allogeneic stem cell transplants are decreasing in Hodgkin lymphoma. So that's a reality. Even I'm a little bit upset, let's put it this way, about it, but that's uh, our clinical reality nowadays. So if you think a potential candidate uh, for an allogeneic stem cell transplantation, I think that probably most of us would agree that not a patient that fails autologous stem cell transplantation and it's only treated with BB is going to be a candidate for an allo. Probably most of us would think of somebody that has already received checkpoint inhibitors. Um, and the major question here uh, would be to discuss uh, what happens if the patient achieves a complete remission. So first of all, would you allograft every single patient that demonstrates a response to a checkpoint inhibitor, so CR or PR. Uh, we know that they are not curative, but we know the potential toxicity of the combination. And would you eventually allograft somebody that achieves a complete remission with checkpoint inhibitors? I would say that uh, many groups would say that probably not all these so, patients Anna, please allow me to interrupt. We will discuss all of these details. I want uh, from you a very simple uh, guideline, I would say, to our audience. And uh, I mean, uh, by the way, congratulations. You are the president-elect now of <laughs> EBMT. And EBMT every other year would publish like recommendations. So what would be the updated recommendations of EBMT? You are the expert for okay. allotransplant and Hodgkin lymphoma. So in one single sentence, probably somebody that has already received the BB and checkpoint inhibitors. And then the question is that at what point after checkpoint inhibition, the patient should be allografted. That's excellent. So important. what is the practice in wonderful? This is exactly what I think. And by the way, uh, the message to our audience and thank you for joining us. It's amazing the number of people who uh, are joining from across the globe. This is fantastic. You can send your questions either using the chat or using the uh, questions uh, uh, box. And I'll do my best to share the questions with the panelists because this is meant to be an interactive uh, journal club. So what is the, situ the situation in Boston? Uh, who are the patients you are allotransplanting today uh, in your center? So first off, I wanted to say thank you. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I'm really excited to talk about um, our paper. So. At, at Dana-Farber, I think we probably have similar criteria to what Anna just discussed. Um, all of our patients will have had BV or a PD-1 inhibitor prior to allo. And actually, a lot of patients are getting those drugs earlier, even before auto in a lot of cases. Um, so, so, you know, for patients who relapsed, 
we often will reach to a clinical trial, but really once you go beyond BV, Nevo, um, there, there aren't other curative options, at least not yet. Um, so I think that's really the role for ALO for patients who are able to achieve some sort of remission. Okay, but but then so now my it looks like that there is a sort of a consensus that you needed to receive the available options, namely brintuximab and uh, anti PD one uh, antibodies. But then what is the level of response you would require? Because uh, uh, I think uh, Dr. Sureda started by alluding to this. Well, it's like a double-edged sword. You know, they are not curative, but if you achieve complete remission, then you would say, uh, well, why should I go uh, to transplant? And on the other hand, once they have relapsed again, they become refractory and you don't have other options. So what are your thoughts about this? I mean, both of you. So, Anna. yeah, okay. So, as you have said, um, I mean, it's a kind of double sides of the coin. So, I would like to have somebody at least in partial remission before taking the patient into another transplant. We know how important is this is status. On the other side, uh, if you achieve a complete remission with checkpoint inhibitor, we know it's not going to be curative, but it's quite a well tolerated drug. So this is one thing that needs to be discussed with the patient. And I guess that many people now would eventually not allograft every single patient achieving a complete remission or would eventually allow patient to eventually relapse, try to achieve another response, which by the way, we can talk about chemosensitization of checkpoint inhibitors uh, to future chemotherapy or eventually radiotherapy, and then allograft patient at, the, at that point. And patient needs to be fully involved in this decision, of course. Great, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think this is a really tough decision. And unfortunately, we don't have great data to guide us. So. As Anna was alluding to, I think there are several retrospective series from Europe and the US that suggest that, um, interestingly, in Hodgkin's lymphoma and in other diseases, PD-1 can sensitize patients to subsequent chemotherapy. So it's likely that the response rates, if you wait for allo um, and re-challenge with a more traditional salvage chemotherapy regimen, are higher than they were 10 years ago. Um, on the other hand, you don't wanna lose your window for transplant. So for patients who have particularly aggressive disease where you're really worried about your ability to achieve a response after PD-1, those are the patients who you might push for an allo earlier. And I think, you know, in the absence of clear data, this is obviously a, a situation where you really have to weigh the patient's um, preferences because allo transplant is a huge decision and, and a huge burden for patients, obviously. And I guess the last thing to say is that we don't really know yet. I think there, there probably is a small percentage of patients who might be cured with PD-1 alone in the same way that it looks like a small percentage of patients treated with BV might be cured five years out or at least being remission five years out. We don't really know who those patients are, but it does seem to be a very small number. Okay, well, wonderful. Uh, so, of course, uh, I, I personally have probably a bias uh, because I'm a transplanter, but uh, my role here is to be fair, balanced, and uh, to try to, uh, I would say, drive the discussion uh, in a critical fashion. So your conclusions read in the article for me are quite enthusiastic and positive. Whereas when I read carefully, I would say, well, Hodgkin lymphoma patients, especially those who are candidate for allotransplant, are relatively young patients. So we're not talking about, you know, the elderly AML or MDS. But still, you have 15% of severe uh, grade 3 to 4 acute GVHD, and you have almost like 20% non-relapse mortality or transplant-related mortality. So how can we temper the uh, enthusiasm uh, here? I mean, do we consider this as a safe approach or how, how can you uh, interpret these uh, data? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a fair criticism. Um, 
I don't know if, if you would ever describe allotransplant as being safe uh, because inherent in the procedure is a high risk of mortality, even with all the improvements we have in, in supportive care. Um, but this is a very high risk population despite their young age. Um, these are patients who, as I recall, had failed a median of four or five lines of therapy. Most had failed auto transplant. Um, so the fact that they had an overall survival over 80% at two years um, is quite impressive. Um, and, and these really are patients, once you get up, once you relapse after PD-1, um, these are patients who don't have new agents um, who have limited treatment options. So I think in this high-risk patient population, um, it's at, definitely at, at least worth considering the very real risk of non-relapse mortality with allotransplant. So uh, if I summarize your opinion is that we are still in a sort of a benefit risk ratio, which is favorable. And, and I, I, I agree with you, but I want to be a little bit provocative. Uh, Anna, would you share the same opinion? Absolutely. In fact, I think that the results presented, although it's a retrospective analysis, they are quite promising. If you remember, Mohammed, old papers eventually published um, by the EBMT or eventually the phase two prospective clinical trial I published many years ago, uh, the PFS was around um, 40% for um, those patients that had some sort of chemosensitive disease at the time of allotransplant. And I think that probably those papers that have presented the survival curves of checkpoint inhibitors plus allogeneic stem cell transplant, like this one, and the two years follow-up of Checkmate 205 that was published by Philippe Armand in this small population of patients really have given impressive results, I would say, in terms of PFS and overall survival. And I am also a transplanter, you know that, but I still think that we are always playing with some sort of non-relapse mortality, which unfortunately is not zero, and with some toxicity associated to transplantation. So I would say um, that my, my, my view is that this paper gives a positive message. Excellent. Thank you very much. So now let's dig a little bit deeper into, and these are the different parameters that are being discussed in this article. How can we further uh, refine and make it safer? And we have uh, several questions about the ideal timing between uh, the use of checkpoint uh, inhibitors and the uh, allotransplant procedure. Uh, Dr. Sergei Gritsayev and many others uh, have raised this issue. So did, did you manage through this very large series rate to get a sort of a magic number there? Uh, no magic number, unfortunately. We, we did try because this is probably the most common question um, that's been asked, I think. Um, so, you know, looking back, um, some consensus guidelines suggested a washout period of six weeks, not based on data. Um, as you probably know, the half-life for PD-1 inhibitors is almost four weeks. Um, so what we did to start was we looked at the median uh, time from last dose of PD-1 to, to allotransplant, which was about 80 days. And we looked before and after that and found um, that those patients who had a PD-1 to transplant interval of less than 80 days had about a two and a half fold increase in severe acute GVHD. Um, and then we looked kind of within that zero to 80 days to see if there was a clear pattern. Um, and we didn't find one. So actually the the, the, if you took patients who had a zero to 40 day interval and a 41 to 80 day interval, the incidence of severe acute GVHD was pretty much identical. Um, so it, it doesn't look like there's like a safe point as much as I wish there was at, at 40 days or 60 days. It seems like the risk kind of continues and then at some point around 80 days or later probably goes down, um, which kind of makes sense if you think about the, the half-life of the drugs um, being being quite long. So in theory, what I hear is that if you give it more time, probably you will improve the safety. But then from a theoretical and immunological perspective, I think these PD-1 antibodies 
are creating a sort of an immune immunostimulatory environment. So you wouldn't you be afraid of losing this immunostimulatory environment? Yeah, so you know there's there's risk and benefit of early transplant after PD1. That's what our data would suggest. So on one hand, there's the heightened risk of acute GVHD. On the other hand, we, we saw for patients who didn't have intervening salvage treatment between PD-1 and transplant, there was a significant reduction in the risk of relapse. Um, so it really makes sense. You have a heightened, heightened T-cell activation, which both uh, is good for GVHD, sorry, good for GVL, and also bad because it heightens the risk of GVHD. Um, so I think, again, this is a, it's probably an individual patient uh, level decision. I think it's probably uncommon that you feel comfortable waiting three months from your last dose of PD-1 to transplant. Um, and for, for those patients who, again, you're really worried about uh, aggressive disease and relapse, you might be willing to tolerate the 20 or 25% risk of severe acute GVHD that we found um, for early transplant after PD-1 blockade. Anna, what is in your practice the ideal timing and how, how would you handle these patients? Well, I think that there, we don't have any ideal timing because unfortunately we are basically running in a very slippery floor because as Ray has said, we don't have definitive data on that. I think that uh, if I remember, uh, Carmelo Carlo Estela presented, you may remember Mohammed some years ago, uh, the preliminary data that were later on published by Philippe Arman. And at this first time, he was already trying to do some potential analysis to see if the levels of nivolumab in this case at day zero had any correlation at all with um, non-relapse mortality and the incidence of acute GVHD. Unfortunately, this study with only 45 patients was negative. And from then, I mean, we have been speculating about which is the ideal the ideal time between the last dose of PD-1 inhibitors and transplantation. I think that the paper published by Raid and the rest of the colleagues gives us a little bit more light, basically because you are looking at more than 200 patients. And of course, I think that the data are a little bit stronger. I would say that everybody is more or less living around two months, probably not more than that, just because you don't want to have somebody relapsing in between and then losing the slot for our transplant. And this is what we are trying to do. So to allow two months and fingers crossed. So we have a question here. Hopefully I'm pronouncing it very well or well. <laughs> Vish, from Dr. Vish Vadeep uh, Kusho asking whether there is a difference in the washout period between uh, nivolumab and pembrolizumab? As I recall, the half-life for both is between three and four weeks, really not much of a difference. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, so, one aspect to try to work around it is the timing, and we know it's a balance between not too short but not too long. Uh, but then the risk, uh, actually, when I look carefully, is about the risk of severe GVHD, especially liver localization. And this is in line with uh, what uh, Anna mentioned about the uh, study by Philippe Armand uh, some time ago. So then uh, one suggestion from your paper read is that uh, maybe using post sci uh, can be attractive to improve the safety. Obviously, you could not control for this parameter because you just collected all the data. So how strong do you feel about this recommendation? Because that reminds me almost seven or eight years ago uh, that Andrea Bashigalupo, when we started you know, doing haplotransplant with lots of enthusiasm, was telling us, well, for the Hodgkin lymphoma, maybe you should use only haplodonors and post sci And that was like maybe a visionary uh, idea, but Andrea has been always visionary, by the way. So uh, do, do you feel uh, comfortable saying, well, they should get post sci So that, that's what our center has done. Um, so, you know, we, we were involved in a lot of the early studies using PD-1 blockade and had several mortalities, several fatalities um, early after transplant for those patients um, with recent PD-1. And 
Johns Hopkins and other centers early on published their experience using post-transplant cyclophosphamide, which anecdotally looked very positive. Um, and then, you know, based on our own experience in this, this paper has certainly made us more confident that PTCY seems to reduce the toxicity and is associated with good outcomes. So yes, all the caveats of, of this being retrospective um, certainly apply, but what we found in the paper was a significant reduction in chronic GVH, which is you know, uh, widespread when you use PTCY. Many others have found that as well. But more importantly, we found a significant reduction in uh, GRFS and also progression-free survival. There was also a trend towards lower rates of acute GVHD, although that didn't reach significance. Um, so I think this paper supports that approach specifically after PD-1 blockade. Whether you want to do haplo PTCY uh, in general for Hodgkin's lymphoma, I think, is a separate question that that our paper doesn't really address. Anna, what are and you doing these days? We we are also doing the same, and I think that probably if you remember that paper, that was a kind of let's say expert consensus. Uh, that was published in blood two or three years ago. Uh, I mean, with some recommendations that had, uh, let's say, um, not uh, a really any strong evidence. Probably from these recommendations, the one that has been more widely spread in different centers has been the use of cyclopost um, when as additional GVHZ prophylaxis when you are using PD-1 before allogeneic stem cell transplant. We always have retrospective analysis, but I think that all these studies that have analyzed this aspect indicate that the incidence of GVHZ after transplant is lower. And I think that independently on the donor, and this is another, I think that very interesting, maybe you want to discuss that, Mohamed, so I don't want to speak too long, but independently on the donor, uh, I mean, the the positive effect of uh, cyclopost is quite clear. Yeah, so definitely, I think you're raising here a major uh, topic for all of us in the transplant field today, where maybe post sci will or would or should uh, become a sort of a backbone for GVHD prophylaxis, uh, irrespective, actually, of the type of donor. But that will take us uh, a little bit uh, beyond, you know, the scope of uh, this uh, uh, journal club. So let's say we're, we're trying to improve the safety and we did our best by, you know, uh, assessing the uh, timing of uh, uh, performing transplant uh, by using post sci but then we're still facing a relatively, in my opinion, high relapse incidence or disease progression after uh, transplant. Would you recommend any sort of a maintenance therapy? Uh, I do acknowledge, outside clinical trial, I do acknowledge that options are limited because we just said earlier that these patients probably failed brintuximab and uh, uh, we are worried about them being failing checkpoint inhibitors and maybe we don't want to give checkpoint inhibitors uh, after transplant so, so outside of a clinical trial i would say no um, we don't use any sort of maintenance strategy and i wouldn't recommend one um, you know that the obvious question that you could ask would be if pd1 before transplant is helpful would pd1 after transplant be helpful um, and there have there have been a few studies now, retrospective and prospective, looking at that strategy for relapse disease after transplant, which shows that you know, it's associated with high response rates, but also very high rates of GVHD, including steroid refractory uh, GVHD with high fatality rates. Um, so I would reserve that um, only for patients who relapse after allo transplant, and I would do it very cautiously. Anna? Yeah, I fully agree. So I think that outside prospective clinical trials, no maintenance in this setting. And uh, as Ray has mentioned, I think that quite a spectacular results on the efficacy of checkpoint inhibitors in those patients that relapse after allo, but with um, this increased incidence of severe GBHD. So I think that you have to be really careful and maybe pick up some patients that would have less probabilities to develop GBHD after receiving checkpoint inhibitors. Of course, everything uh, 
based on retrospective analysis and low numbers of patients. That this is one thing that one might take into consideration. So we have a few questions here on how to monitor. So if you're not using uh, any maintenance strategy, which I believe is quite fair approach, uh, how to monitor uh, the disease in these patients uh, after transplant? Just classical way, PET scan, or anything special? We've question, we have questions about NGS, any value for NGS? <laughs> <laughs> or um, uh, any value for chimerism actually uh, as a surrogate marker for relapse? I mean, we have data in acute mild leukemia. I don't know whether in Hodgkin lymphoma this is something uh, of concern or, or of interest. So, um, let's say with respect to chimerism, I think that the, from my point of view, probably the most interesting data comes from the kind of old data published by the UK cooperative group uh, where they were using a different uh, platform strategy including campus uh, let's say as GBHD prophylaxis and in this case um, there is a very nice paper that Calpex published several years ago indicating that uh, reverting patients that were mixed chimera after allogeneic stem cell transplant was able to decrease the relapse rate after allogeneic transplantation. In our setting, not using campus, um, let's say the value of um, mixed chimerism, I, I wouldn't say that it's so clear in this specific group of patients. And basically, I have to say that with one exception, I have not seen any patient being mixed chimera after an allogeneic stem cell transplant in Hodgkin lymphoma. And to follow up these patients, unfortunately, we don't have NGS, we don't have still liquid biopsy or these fancy techniques that would be really very interesting to use. And we have to I would say that we have to rely on traditional methods. We are normally not using PET CT or eventually any, let's say, imaging technique to follow our patients. Ray, do you agree? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we, we've been using uh, PET scans after transplant or CT scans for patients who run a CR, although the, the data for that is limited. And I think, uh, as Anna said, uh, we don't have uh, an NGS platform yet for Hodgkin's lymphoma. I know lots of different groups are working on that. Um, and hopefully in the next several years, we'll have um, an NGS assay that we can use because there are a lot of interesting ways that you could think about using it in this disease in the transplant setting and also in earlier lines of therapy as well. So let me go back to the uh, patient who are candidate to transplant and how to optimize the response rate before transplant. Because we have a very nice question from Dr. Raul Gabus from Uruguay. And here I'd like to say hello to all my friends in Montevideo and in Uruguay and in South America in general. Thank you for joining us, Raul. He's a very good friend. Uh, and his question is, if you are using uh, PD-1, anti-PD-1 antibodies, but you're not achieving CR before transplant, uh, and the patient did not receive prior brentuximab, would you add brentuximab uh, to achieve CR and then proceed to transplant? Um, I would. I think the data, um, there have been a number of different studies of, of BV plus nivolumab um, that, that all suggest that uh, the CR rate with the combination is quite a bit higher than the CR rate with, any indi with, with one individual component. So I think an, a, a key area right now is trying to figure out what medications we should add uh, to PD-1 blockade. Um, so um, Alison Moskowitz presented Pembro plus GBD um, at ASH this past year um, in the pre-auto setting, the second line setting, and that had an extremely high CR rate in the 90 percentile range, which suggests that maybe one of those drugs is a really um, synergistic agent, gem gemcitabine maybe, it's, it's not clear. But I think um, adding GBD, adding BV, either of those would be a, a reasonable strategy. So here I have a comment from Dr. Vanessa Patronella, who is asking uh, uh, the question about the sequence. Should we use checkpoint inhibitors first, then uh, brentuximab, or vice versa? Uh, 
and whether this has any impact on the toxicity, especially GBHD. Anna, would you take this one? You mean you mean before our transplant? So I think uh, I think that um, I mean outside perspective, clean, clinical trials normally patients receive BB before, and then if they fail fail BB, then they go ahead with checkpoint inhibitors. And as Raid has mentioned just at the very beginning, we are going to see more and more patients, probably in Europe a little bit later than US, that have failed BB and eventually checkpoint inhibitors in earlier lines of treatment. So if I have to put the combination, probably I would start with BB and eventually move to checkpoint inhibitors. But I think that there are not so many data regarding, let's say, this, uh, this situation. Well, uh, guys, this is really a fascinating topic. We can spend hours and hours. So I'll ask the last question. And I do apologize uh, to all our colleagues. I mean, there are plenty of questions. Uh, Dr. Rashpol, we will not be able to address the role of tandem auto, allo, frontline, and all of this. I do apologize. Uh, one more last question just to see what is the future in this disease? Uh, what are the future perspectives? Because, uh, I mean, uh, in every hematologic malignancy now, if you look to clinicaltrials.gov, you see dozens and dozens of novel agents and trials. Uh, what is the more exciting perspective for you, Red, in the Hodgkin lymphoma? Is it about anti-CD30 CAR T cells? Is it about any other agent? And I'll ask the same question to Anna. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be excited about for Hodgkin's lymphoma treatment right now. So there, um, there, there are trials of CD30 CAR T cells that have high response rates, although um, mm. with limited number of patients, it's unclear if they're gonna be curative. And, and we know that the tumor microenvironment for Hodgkin's lymphoma is very immunosuppressive, which which might be a hard setting to deploy CAR T cell therapy, at least as a monotherapy. Um, there are a lot of other agents that really get at targeting the, the immunosuppressive microenvironment. We know that um, from Scott Rodick's work and Margaret Schiff's work that tumor-associated macrophages are um, important in maintaining that immunosuppression around the reed sternberg cells. So we're opening a trial in collaboration with Stanford looking at um, CD47, um, monoclonal, CD47 agent plus PD-1 blockade um, to try to really target those uh, tumor-associated macrophages. So there, there are a lot of other um, different avenues. Um, so hopefully five or 10 years down the road, we'll be using less allotransplant in this disease because more patients will be cured. Um, but I think that allotransplant will still be an important uh, treatment modality for, for a fraction of our patients. Anna? So basically, I fully agree. Of course, everybody is very much excited with CAR T cells. The results in Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, let's say we, we need more follow-up, and although the complete remission rate is quite high, then the follow-up is not so bright as probably in other diseases. I think that we have new anti-PD-1s, which are really very effective in phase two prospective clinical trials. We have biospecific monoclonal antibodies, anti-CD30 or an anti-CD16A uh, in combination with um, checkpoint inhibitors and other combinations. So I think that the future for patients with relapsed refractory Hodgkin lymphoma is going to be quite bright in the, in the next few years. Hopefully some of these drugs or combinations reach the market outside prospective clinical trials, which is another issue. And I will have to admit that probably the numbers of others is going to decrease, but I still think that at least for the time being is the only curative strategy uh, that we have in our hands. So this is one thing that needs to be taken into consideration. Remembering that the median age of these patients is 30 years, it's not 60 or 65. Well, I think this has been really a wonderful conclusion. Lots of hope uh, to all Hodgkin lymphoma patients, but also to all patients with uh, blood uh, diseases. Uh, I do thank you both for really uh, very clear, very uh, important uh, uh, journal club. Uh, I really appreciate. Uh, again, Raid, congratulations for running 
a very difficult work. I mean, I could count almost 40 different institutions you managed to put together, uh, which is really uh, a great achievement. So congratulations and good luck with the other projects. And of course, again, uh, congratulations, uh, Anna, uh, for your election as the next president of the EBMT. And uh, thank you all for being uh, loyal uh, to the ICH uh, activities. And uh, wherever you are, please stay safe and keep well and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.